Let me see if this light. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Lee for SpeedEndurance.com, and welcome to Speed Endurance TV. So on tonight's episode, we have Ryan Banta, best-selling author of the Sprinter's Compendium book, available on Amazon as well, and he's also a coach. And I think we started this discussion because I posted something about doing 10 bounds for distance and comparing myself with Will Clay, the world-class triple jumper, and I had a bunch of charts, and there was a lot of engagement going on on Twitter. And I thought it was good to get Brian on board and talk about the series of uh, tests, when we do it, why we do it, and do they even correlate or translate. So Ryan, welcome. Thank you for making time for this today. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on. I'm looking forward to the discussion. OK, so let's, um, so we have um, a slide deck here that we're going to present. And there we go. Can you see, can you see the screen? Ryan, can you see the screen? Um, yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. So let's start talking about testing. Ryan, um, yeah, on to you. So when we look at, you know, testing, one of the things that I found really interesting, uh, having a lot of discussions, especially in terms of how to train, what to do and what to do in a situation that we're in right now where we're kind of stuck at home, we're not allowed to get out and move about. And your post that you put on uh, Twitter and, and Facebook about 10 bounds and the correlation to, you know, elite sports performance in the 100 meter dash really resonated with me because it's something that I thought a lot about in our situation when we're quarantined is what's the right choice of activities to do and what are some things that maybe we can improve at home or test at home that will allow us to better prepare ourselves once we're allowed to get back onto our tracks, our clubhouses, things like that where we're supposed to train and a way to keep ourselves motivated in spite of the fact that we might not be able to do traditional track and field or sports performance type workouts. And so we look at what we're testing, I kind of thought that, you know, what are we trying to test? What are we trying to improve? And on a recent call, that I had with um, Tony Holler and Chris Corfus that was with one of their series that they've been doing recently, you know, they were talking about bigger, faster, stronger. And Corfus' first question that he always asks people that he's going to work with or provide training plans for is which one of those should be first? Well, obviously, the bigger, faster, stronger folks, you know, the strength and conditioning guys, they tend to overemphasize weight room, uh, increasing poundage, getting big for American football things like that versus probably what's more important, which is speed. So today what we're going to do is we're going to kind of break down the things that you need to do to evaluate somebody who's supposed to be a fast twitch athlete in a series and battery of tests that we're going to work for. So we're going to be much more down on that speed corner of the uh, triangle than the strength or endurance one today when we're talking about testing. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So. Why should we test? Yeah, so obviously one reason for testing is to keep our athletes motivated in the absence of competitions. This is incredibly important uh, in a traditional season with the long periods of time in between competitive phases, but even more important in a time period of how do we keep our athletes engaged? How do we keep them inspired? How do we keep them motivated when they're quarantined? So there's a lot of different philosophies on this. For me, what I like to do with my athletes, and we'll get into it more as we talk, you know, through this conversation, <clears throat> is I want to make sure that I'm developing a powerful, explosive athlete. And so on the right, I have an image of what's called a radar graph. And this is where they've layered over a bunch of different things that different sports find valuable and their most elite athletes through those sports tend to check off the boxes at a rating system, you know, you could go from one to 10, one to five or whatever, and then move your way around depending on what you're trying to test. And so for me, again, this is a way of kind of showing and demonstrating strengths and weaknesses of the athlete. And I think it's an important process to do is to kind of develop a battery of tests that help you figure out, okay, how agile is my athlete? What's their analytical aptitude? You know, basically how smart are they or how um, creative they might be? you know, speed, power, strength, these type of things, durability. So there's all these types of tests that you want to develop 
And then that chart and charting that information out will give you some sort of what I would like to call bumper rails in terms of this is what it takes to be an elite athlete based off of these tests. Now, as a teacher, we hate to teach to the test, but the test does tell us something. And so it's always important to test your students and to test your athletes to figure out things that are going on. Tony Holler feels that, you know, his idea of record, rank, and publish is really important to keep his athletes motivated in terms of what's important, constantly building that competitive drive for a warrior type of athlete versus a thinker type of athlete. And so he uses a series of tests throughout the winter and throughout the summer to kind of keep his athletes motivated. And then he publishes those things out to the world. So, you know, it's the idea of not just kind of showing off, like, look how great my kids are, but it's actually more important to build a competitive fire amongst his sprint unit and then also to hold them accountable. Tony Wells, he had a philosophy and a system, which I've discussed in other places at Altus and in a couple other conversations with Robbie um, and the OPEX uh, fitness folks. And his system, and I don't want to go into too much depth about it, but it entirely relied upon testing. And the three tests were standing long jump, uh, power clean, or some kind of Olympic lift variation, and then flying short sprints. So it takes kind of the basic essence of what Tony does and adds the other two paradigms to it, which are this kind of idea of the jump you know, part of it, which is more of the power part, the weight part, which is more of the strength part, and then, of course, keeping the speed. And then he would test those three paradigms through different phases um, throughout the season to try to figure out, okay, where is my athlete, you know, weak, and where is my athlete strong, and then what do I want to do to address it? And some things I find really interesting about that is one of the famous quotes from Tony Wells is, don't just test to test, test with purpose. The only reason why we're testing is so that we can learn something about our athletes and therefore improve them. So I find that to be really interesting. And one of the things that I find value in testing is kind of getting a deeper discovery of athletes. I'm a high school coach. So the first time I meet these athletes, they're probably going to be 13, 14, 15 years old. They have athletic experience, but most people don't come to track and field as that's their first sport. Typically track and field they come to because they're trying to get in shape or something else or someone kind of leveraged them into competing or doing something and they realize, oh, I have some innate talent. Well, that's fine and good, but we need to figure out what are those talents? Where are your strengths and weaknesses? Because just because you might be the best kid at your school and the fastest kid at your school in the 100 meters, that doesn't necessarily mean the 100 meters should be your event. So I feel like testing, giving us a chance to figure out what our strengths and weaknesses of our athletes are, is really, really important. More importantly, if you think about Anatoly Bondarchuk's system where he's constantly changing things up when he finally sees and improves sports performance from a training stimulus, it's an idea of a check on coaching. So not only do we want to see what our athletes are doing and if they're doing well or what their strengths and weaknesses are, we also need to figure out, well, what are our strengths and weaknesses in our training plan? You know, ultimately, and we'll get into this as we talk, not all tests are created equal. Some tests are more important and have a higher value in terms of what we're really getting done in practice, how the athlete is adapting, and the chances of that athlete being really great. Another thing I use my testing for is maybe a, an ability to get the kid in a better event. So even though a kid might be, we had a young lady named Lizzie Dejwa. And she was really fast as a freshman in the 100-meter dash. Um, but the only thing that would tell you that she was really fast was the times on the stopwatch. Everything else you would see about her, you're like, that athlete does not look like a sprinter. She doesn't move like a sprinter. She doesn't open up like a sprinter. She doesn't have a good block start. But she's pretty darn fast. Well, sure enough, wouldn't you know it, as we moved up in distance, she got better and better and better and ended up being, you know, in the top eight in the state of Missouri in a 5,000 meters and um, over a really gnarly cross-country course. And she also was the best girl in the state of Missouri in the 800 meters. So this young lady was fast, but she was a really fast long sprinter or AKA short distance runner, which I don't like to use that term very often. Yeah. Um, another thing, thing that's, yeah, yeah go but ahead. But the thing, with, the thing with testing is that I can give you two people that I coached. One, um, she was 
dominant in testing. She would destroy everyone in time trials, but come race day, she would just crumble. And conversely, I had another guy who just was terrible at testing. He just didn't perform well on test day, but come game day, he would just raise his game and the competition atmosphere would make him a better athlete. Uh, so, you know, it's like school. Just because you have a, you know, uh, you know 2.8 on 4 GPA doesn't mean you're smart. Uh, as opposed to 4.0 GPA and conversely, you know, there's book smart and there's, and there's street smart. So same thing about testing. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I think that that also speaks to the mental fortitude of those athletes and maybe the, the, the brain setup that they are. Right. And so when we're talking about that, you have to think about, and we'll talk more about this. Are they a thinker athlete or are they a warrior type? And there's actually data to show that there are D DNA and some genes that might gear our athletes one way or another. And then from that, a, an inability to perform, um, even though they can do the tests really well, or conversely, you know, not doing well in the tests and perform like crazy, really speaks to some strategies that we should develop for our athletes in practice. Because like you said, they're not all the same and what's smart and what's not depending on how you grade something out, could totally be different depending on the field of play and the task at hand. So for me, when I'm about to make tests and put them together, it's really important to figure out what you're going to do ahead of time. And I know some of these things we have on here seem obvious, but location really matters. So if I am going to put together a database that I'm gonna trust that's going to inform me in the future about my athletes and help guide me not only in what event they do, but also what, you know, uh, units of work that we do in practice or strategies periodization wise, et cetera. Location is important. And I know people go, well, what does that matter? Well, if you're constantly doing the tests at different facilities, different tracks, different directions, right? On a different part of the track, that's going to change your outcome especially if you're doing tests that have small windows of, of error. So if you're doing a flying 10, the surface area, the length that you have of decelerization, the length that you have of acceleration, how hard that surface is, the direction of the wind, all of those things are gonna matter. And it's important to keep that as consistent as possible. Um, who does the test? You know, one year is kind of silly, but we always do the standing long jump, which we'll talk about later. But that's one of our major tests. Well, one year, everybody improved by a foot. And I'm like, what the heck? I know we didn't do a whole lot different this year. Why is everyone testing better? And sometimes it's just experience with the test also makes you a better test taker as well. Doesn't mean you've actually improved your physical qualities. You've just hacked or nerfed the test, right? Well, sure enough, one of my coaches who I love to death, he's a great teacher, but he didn't have a lot of experience in track. So he was growing into the coaching role of track and field through me. And this is the first day of practice in the first season. And he was measuring from the front of their toes wow. <laughs> instead of the back of their heels. There you go. Literally a foot, not just in inches, um, you know, on the imperial scale, but that's, that's what's happening. So it's really important so that if the person who's giving the test is always making a slight error, that's okay because that data can still inform you, even if that data might not help other people outside your program, inside your program with your own data set, it can help. No, definitely. Um, so how about frequency? I know my program is three weeks hard, one week easy, and I use that easy week to do my testing. Um, it works for me. It also works back in Canada and the US because you had US Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, there were like three weeks, one, three weeks, one. Uh, so those weeks we don't do testing, but we always do testing September, October, and then, and then come January. So how often do you uh, do your testing? What's your frequency? Well, depending on if I've got them over the winter or we're just talking about the athletes coming out for the three month period of the season, Traditionally, my philosophy is no matter what, is very similar to you. I go three weeks up and I unload the fourth week and we usually drop 10 to 20% off of volume and load. And if we're out of season, we're gonna do our test on that fourth week. If we're in season, we're gonna try to match up their best event 
on that week as well. So we give them their legs back, we give them their arms back to give them an opportunity to say, okay, we've done all this training. What are the effects? What's the outcome? Have we made improvements? Have we gone backwards? And so we basically do every three weeks. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, because I'm a high school coach and we only have three months, three and a half months of a track season, you know, we have to use our competitions as tests. But early on in the year, it's usually that third week. Now, for me, in the regular season, I like to do some testing the very first day because um, I like to, you know, I kind of think of it like being Christmas and I get to open up all these presents and I want to know what I got. You know, I want to know how much the kids have improved from the previous year. <clears throat> and I want to know how good in particular modalities or abilities or skill sets my athletes are that are rookies or new in my program. Now, in addition to that three up and one down, we also tend to follow a theme. So I'll have a speed week, a power week, a strength or endurance week, and then the recovery week. And we try to line up our workouts to fit that as well. And if we're in a regular season and we're going to use a race as a test to see where our fitness is at, we're also going to line that up with a meet that we think has a lot of value. And there will be a heightened level of competition to get to squeeze as much adrenaline out of that athlete as possible. So yeah, I think four weeks is good, especially when you're working with warrior type athletes that need frequent testing to keep themselves motivated and engaged in the process. Sounds good. So let's talk about the, say, five different types of tests. We have running tests, uh, weight room tests, uh, jumping for height, jumping for distance, and maybe some throws like backward throws. So let's, uh, let's, let's get into some of these tests now, Ryan. Sure. So the chart you have here on the right is, is the chart that you'd posted up um, from your, your blog and your website. And I think it's really valuable and it speaks to a lot of things. And most importantly, one of the things that I think we get in love with too much is the weight room. Um, as strength and conditioning people and track coaches, we look at the weight room as being one of the easy ways to get improvements out of our athletes and they can see they're improving because we're putting more weight on the bar. But here you look at jump testing maybe being more valuable and maybe having a higher correlation to accurate predictors in performance. And the reason why this is, is because of the fact that when we're running really fast or we're sprinting really fast, we're jumping from one leg to another. It's a very plyometric activity. But for me, going back to the idea of, of what Corfis was talking about and Tony and others, speed is the number one thing. Speed is the most important thing. You can always find big people. Like there are thousands upon thousands, maybe millions of ginormous men and women in the United States. But what separates them from being a big lumbering pokey type person and being someone who could make the NFL or, you know, women's rugby or, or something like that is the fact that they can move and that they're fast. So speed is always going to be the first test that we're going to lay out because just in the order of operations, we want our athletes to be neurologically fresh because via uh, max velocity requires a really fresh nervous system and high percentages of effort of 93 to 95 um, at the lowest to actually create improved absolute speed. And so then from there, we're gonna to move to the jumps, which are more of the test for power. You know, so we're slowing the contacts down a little bit, but we're projecting the center of mass either up vertically or horizontally a lot, and we can learn quite a bit about that. Then I would probably do agility, but since I'm in a linear sport, I don't spend as much time worrying about agility tests. That's for the fall and the summer. Um, in the off seasons when athletes are doing other sports that require more, you know, side to side, up and down and backwards movement. But that doesn't mean that in training, I don't incorporate those things because I do, because I want to keep my athletes healthy. And it's been proven that athletes that move through all planes of motion and movement uh, tend to be the healthiest athletes. It's just not something that I spend a lot of time as a track coach in testing, but I did a lot when we were doing American football. You know, we do the pro shuttle. And, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, tests for strength, obviously, are fourth in my importance because, again, there are plenty of very, very, very strong people, but uh, very few bodybuilders are, you know, lining up for the Olympic final in 2012 in London for the 100-meter dash. You know, they're fit people, they're strong, they're athletic, 
but they're not bodybuilders. So that's gonna be fourth in terms of importance. Testing for injury prevention, that's something we do often um, in season and out of season. I've got a really good trainer that runs our athletes through the functional uh, movement screens and things like that and provides us drills and activities so that we're being prescriptive um, to keep our athletes healthy. So if they've got something funky and imbalance, um, a weakness in you know some sort of articulating joint, um, we're going to attack that specifically for those athletes. And we've done that. I have a family that they're immigrants from Nigeria and each and every one of them has had serious problems with lower leg soreness, um, stress reactions, things like that. So we've radically changed some of the protocols that we do for those athletes so that they have a looser ankle, so they can move through the joints and they're more fluid. And then we also spend a little bit of time on the bike instead of on hard surface, as I would maybe with some of my other athletes. And through this testing and mobility screening, you can figure a lot of that stuff out. Testing for endurance, that's not per se like going out and running the mile, but we do do that in a high school track team because I have to do that because we have 19 events. But if I'm doing this for sprinters, that endurance is more based around race modeling, running 150s, 250s, um, longer intervals, or maybe doing what we're going to talk about here in the, in the short term, talking about doing runs for time or covering distance for time, as opposed to just running a 350 or a 450. And then the last thing is we need to know what makes our athletes tick. So I like to give them a couple questions that they have to answer to show me if they're left or right brained, to show me how much they value family and how honest they are. You know, if an athlete tells you they're lazy, they're lazy. And if they're telling you they're lazy, they're being honest too, which is a really interesting thing. They're not just telling you the answer you want to hear. They're telling you the answer they think you need to hear. And I find a lot of value in that, even though that's considered a negative stereotype in terms of a personality trait, it's something I find important because it informs me on the athlete before I start coaching them. That's pretty good. That's quite, quite exhaustive. Uh series of tests I, I never considered the last last few but let's go into some specifics uh, on the next slides um yeah okay let's start with uh this slide here hamstring versus quad centric what kind of tests do you do and types of tests do you do to test this so um jonas who is uh you know uh, he was mentored by dan pass says if it was up to him he'd want all his athletes to be pullers you know or nervous driven uh, sprinters and more simply put hamstring centric sprinters but when you get these athletes they've learned to run and be fast through different modes of movement and a hamstring centric and a quad centric sprinter they're going to inform you on the things that you probably need to do in training to maximize their strengths so before we can do that you know obviously you can look at uh, both Craig Pickering and Asafa Powell and you could probably figure out who's the quad centric sprinter and who's the hamstring centric sprinter just by body position, toe off, bend at the knee and how, you know, they're built. I mean, Asafa Powell is a well-built guy and he lifted a lot of weights and all that kind of stuff before he heard, he heard his pectoral muscle benching a ton. But Craig Pickering is a monster. You know, he ended up being a pretty successful bobsledder after uh, his career in sprinting. You know, Craig is a quadricentric sprinter, really good at the 60 meter dash, really good at the 100, rarely runs the 200, you know, even though I kind of back about seven or eight years ago, I was pushing on him to run the two because I felt like it probably would help his 100. Um, but he's a quad centric sprinter and he looks the part, Now, just because he looks the part of a rugby player, you know, um, or a fo American football player, that doesn't always mean that a guy built like that's gonna be a quad centric sprinter, but they tend to be. And then the more lean, long, bouncy guys tend to be hamstring centric. Now, beyond that, other ways that you can test, you can test to see if they like to throw uh, a medicine ball forward, you know, so they hop forward and throw forward, and do they tend to trend outward? you know, beyond their peers in that? Or do they like to throw the medicine ball overhead and back with a jump? And they tend to trend as an outlier that way. If they tend to trend as an outlier with the forward toss, they're probably quad centric. If they tend to trend, you know, as an outlier with the overhead back, they're probably hamstring centric because that's where they're powerful and explosive and they feel strong. If they like to deadlift, 
they're probably a hamstring centric sprinter. If they like to squat, they're probably a quad. You know, um, if they tend to double arm, which we'll talk about here, or single arm bound, if they double arm bound to a triple jump movement, they tend to be more of a quad centric sprinter. If they single arm, they tend to be more hamstring because they're bouncy and they're going through that natural fluid movement. So there's all these types of things that you can do to test them. Now, once you figure that out, then there's going to be consequences to what type of sprinter they are. So if they're quad centric, they're gonna do much better with bilateral lifts and jumps. If they're hamstring centric, they're gonna be doing much better with unilateral jumps, single leg, um, weight room action, proprioceptive types of things. If they're a quad centric, you tend to have to cue them on the ground, what they're doing in the ground or when they're touching something. If they're a hamstring centric sprinter, you spend more time cueing them of what they should be feeling internally as opposed to what they're feeling externally through the pressure of their feet. And so there's all sorts of things that um, can be done to kind of benefit these athletes, but you've got to figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are and where they kind of lean. Now, one of the things, because kind of going with what Jonas said, with preferring hamstring centric sprinters, I like to work on their weaknesses in the off season because you can take some risks, but in the in season, I would much rather work on their strengths because you don't want to wreck, you know, the model. If it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of idea. But over the off season, you can play with some of their weaknesses to try to attack those things and mess with those things when they're not under the pressure of pushing and pulling in competition. Yeah, good point. I remember when I was a uh, submaster, so 35 years old, and I was training under Kevin Tyler in Vancouver. And in, in the first week of practice, he saw me running. He says, Jimson, you're very quad centric. I was, and by then, I'm 35 years old. I've been running for nine years. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. But then, you know, we did some changes with some uh, mock drills and, and, you know, heel flicks, uh, butt kicks, and try to work on that backside mechanics a bit more just to get that hamstring development working. And, and, and it worked out, actually. So, okay, that's good. Let's move on to some speed tests. That's, I think people want to hear speed tests. So, um, yeah. Uh, well, really, uh, in, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, let's, people, let's talk about the, the traditional you know, 30 meter tests and uh, block start, and then a 30 meter uh, fly time. Talk about some sure. of your experiences and, and what you get out of it. Sure, so this is another way to kind of figure out a quad versus hamstring centric athlete as well. So it kind of blends into this. You know, if they're really um, an outlier as an accelerator, they could be a quad centric. If they're really an outlier as a flying sprinter, you know, they're way over the top, but they maybe their, their acceleration isn't as good that probably informs you on what type of athlete they are. And just thinking about um, some of the pictures that you actually shared, Jimson, from back in the day when you were running as a younger guy, I could have probably told you that you were quad centric because I'm thinking of a particular picture where I feel like you had a real deep knee bend at contact and the leg even looked twisted. Do you know what I mean? Like you're really, and I'm sure you're running indoors and you're on the turn, but it was, it was interesting because you could see that amortization and that kind of really going down and then really forcing that foot back off the ground. So that's a nice catch from Kevin Tyler back in the day with you. So that's really, really interesting. Now, these two tests, in my opinion, are by far the cream of the crop. If you can't do anything else, these two tests will inform more about your athlete's ability set or potential because pretty much everything we do in track and field requires fast, fast, fast twitch athletes and a high rate of speed. But even in most sports that aren't golf, you know, or things like that, you need to be explosive. You need to be fast. And even when people are like, well, you know, on a basketball court, you never reach full speed. Well, no, you don't, but you've talked a lot about speed reserve and the importance of it. And so even if you're not going at full speed on a basketball court, your 80% is going to be at a much higher velocity than other people's 80%. And that's going to improve your overall ability because you have the speed reserve where you can run up and down the basketball court without giving much effort and never being behind and never having to worry about trying to make a real bad play to cut off an athlete trying to head to the baseline for, for a basketball you know, shot. And so this test, even though you think this might be for track, these are great for everyone. For me specifically, out of the two, 
The most important between the two is the flying test. In my school's history, and I've got a database now of over a decade of these tests with my athletes done in a very similar way in pretty much the exact same location and done by me. So I'm the only person who have done these tests for may, almost two decades, um, but I've got data on 10 years. And what I've found is on the Flying 30, 18 of the top 20 scores that I have in the Flying 30, all of those young ladies, except for the two, were state qualifiers or all state track and field athletes in Missouri. And I know a lot of people who are international listeners have no idea about Missouri track and field, but we're really good. We are really good, especially for our size. You know, we have the world record holder under 18, um, just up the road from me and Justin Robinson. He's coached by my mentor and he's a critical mass trained athlete. And this flying 30 is so critically important. And then what's interesting is even if their scores aren't that good, but they're a distance runner, guess what? The fastest kids that are distance runners in the flying 30 are also the best distance runners. So even though they might not be in the top 40 amongst my athletes all time in the flying 30, amongst themselves in their specific event group, lo and behold, they tend to be the best, you know, and we have the state record in Missouri for the four by eight. And I've had many um, look at our program with the best athletes in state history, I have the most representation of all the events I've got is in the 800 statewide. And so even with that flying 30 for them, it becomes important because it gives you an idea of their potential and their ability. The really cool thing about these tests is they're not physically or energy system exhaustive. They are neurologically exhaustive, but you can do these with some frequency. And sometimes if you take the Tony Holler feed the cats model, this is all you have to do in some practices and you're going to get a lot out of it as long as you raise the adrenaline up to get the 93 to 95% effort that you want. And then what I typically do is I'll take the standing 30, and the flying 30, make that a 60. And then that really helps, especially when you're in the beginning of the season or in a training plan where you haven't done a lot of speed work that will inform you about their ability set, not only to the 60, but probably the 100 meter dash as well, without having them to run the 100 meter dash or something longer to figure those speeds out. Yeah, no, exactly. It all comes down to speed. And I, I can't stress that more than, you know, uh, promoting speed in all sports, even marathon runners. It all comes down to how fast your 100 is, how fast your 30 is, really. So, uh, it's a good point. Let's um, let's move on. I, I like this actually. Um, let's go to power. Uh, power is one of my favorite ones, which was the one I was talking about. My ten bounds for distance from a standing start. Uh, there's also another one that we do, which is only five bounds but from a running start. Um, tell me some of your uh, tests and success rates and any kind of correlations that you've seen with these tests. Well, for sure, the standing long jump does a great job in testing block clearance. So the people who have the best standing long jump tend to be the best clears from the blocks um, that also tend to be our best long jumpers and triple jumpers. So even though, you know, a dirty secret behind the curtain in my program is we've not been very good in the high jump or the pole vault. And there's some reasons for that. But we've been very, very good in the horizontal jumps. Um, you know, we had a young lady break our school record last year. She went 18, six, uh, 18 feet, six inches, which is a pretty nice jump for a high schooler. And she also happened to be one of our best 400 meter runners in school history. Um, and she was a really good triple jumper too. And sure enough, when she first came out in our program, she was, she tested high on the standing and the, the, we have actually a standing five bounds. Cause a lot of these kids just can't do 10. They're not in shape enough to really do that and maintain it they kind of break down. So we shortened that up and went to five yeah. from a standing, but in the standing long jump and the five repeat bounds from a standing, she was off the charts, even though her standing 30 and flying 30 weren't that great. Well, she was a gym, she was a gymnast and she had been used to running a certain way to run to the vault, right. In, in gymnastics. And once we kind of tweaked that stuff over time, she kept getting faster and faster and faster but if you would have looked at her body build and the way that she was put together, you would have thought this kid is a distance runner. She was a strength bean, you know, and, and looked and acted like a traditional distance runner. 
And so if it wasn't for these tests, the test for power and the knowledge that we knew that she was a gymnast, um, she might have never done her best event and ended up being the school record holder. Um, and that she broke a record for us that had been there since 1981. So, I mean, there were a lot of other good jumpers in between that time, but she was by far the best. Now, why is this important? Well, if you look down here on the chart, which is from uh, Anatoly Bondarchuk's tra transfer of training, it shows correlations to alternative training means besides running and how much they correlate to improve sports performance. Now, what's really crazy about this is a power clean and snatch for an elite woman can possibly negatively impact or negatively correlate. So if you're spending time doing a power clean or a snatch as a runner who's a female sprinter under 23 seconds, you're probably wasting your time. But then if you drag down, you'll notice, oh, well, what does correlate? Well, these repeat bounds sure do correlate. They're the highest almost by double. So that should inform your training as well as to what you should be doing. And even if an athlete doesn't do well on those first two tests that we talked about, but they do well on this, that informs you that they have the ability, they just haven't learned how to use it as a, you know, maximum velocity type setup or an acceleration setup. So you're now informed, okay, those are the things that I can attack as a weakness and then in the regular season, I can build on this strength of this bounding power ability that this athlete has. And eventually, over time, we'll build this complete athlete who will be dangerous. And sure enough, this young lady who graduated in 2019, she ended up also setting our varsity record in total points scored throughout a career. So she became really good at the 100, really good at the 200, really good at the 400, the long, the triple, the high jump. She probably could have been a great hurdler if I wanted to take that risk, but the injuries just didn't make sense for how good she was at other things, you know. And so we just kept moving down the line of the jumps and the long sprints, and it worked out really, really, really well. And again, but the, yeah, go ahead. But, but I think the biggest, biggest uh, question on Twitter was, does it correlate to sprinting? Like Nick Newman wrote back right away saying he had a Finnish uh, triple jumper, uh, I guess, in college at Berkeley. And his five bounds was more than my 10 bounds. And he can't even, you know, doesn't break 11 seconds in 100 meters. Uh, so his off the charts, but he's a triple jumper. So is there any correlation between doing uh, the bounds, let's say, yeah, you know, the bounding events and sprinting? That's the big question. And if you look at a force velocity curve, you know, elastic power is somewhere, you know, in, in the middle. How does it correlate? And if there is a correlation, well, I think that, you know, if you went back to that chart and you look at this chart, mm -hmm. there is a correlation. There's a correlation to improve sports performance. I think it's interesting. You got to ask the question is, why is that finish jumper so darn good at that one thing? I bet you that there was an early intervention training wise that they basically said, okay, long term development model. Instead of giving this kid a variety of experiences as an athlete as they grow, we're gonna only focus on this. And so what that should tell you is, instead of just accepting it, it's one of those things where you're like, this is great, this is strong, this shows that they should be super elite in this area as well, but they're not. Well, in the off season, let's really address that problem and move that needle down. Maybe he'll never be a 10-2 guy because that's just not, in his ability, he's just very elastic. He's, you know, he's very bouncy. He might have a really low uh, body weight to, you know, to body weight to power ratio and all that kind of stuff. But if you got the kid down to a 10-5, how much better of a jumper would he be? And Tony Wells would tell you, because he's not testing out well over here, but he's testing out extremely as an outlier over here, you have a glaring problem that you must address to make this athlete better. I mean, if you look at uh, Mondo, uh, the, the pole vault kiddo from LSU, the guy, when he was in high school, he was able to run as a high schooler, um, I think it was his junior season, a 1060 FAT 100 meter dash. It's a pretty fast dude. You know, Anatoly Bondarchuk, or not Anatoly Bondarchuk, sorry, Sergey Buka, getting my 
Russians and Ukrainians mixed up. Um, Sergei Bukka was a low 10 meter or 10 second 100 meter dash guy as well, if you believe those numbers. So it requires a certain window of ability. And if the other skill sets aren't within that window, those are opportunities to attack to dramatically improve the athlete. And Tony Wells would have demanded it. I mean, that's why he called it adapt or die. He's like, you are going to adapt to this weakness and we're going to make this better. If we don't, then, you know, we're going to just keep grinding until I see a training stimulus out of it. Same thing with Anatoly Bondarchuk. You know, he wouldn't change the stimulus until he saw a change. And then he would go and move to a new stimulus to try to continue to chase that better and better athlete. It's really interesting. So, yeah, I think you ask a good question. And, you know, obviously Nick Newman is much smarter than me about the jokes. But um, I think that there's an opportunity there. And it would be interesting to see the history and the training logs of that Finnish athlete when they were younger. Yeah, and also he can lead the spare four-by-one relay guy if we need to, right? <laughs> Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's another reason why we do all these tests because, um, especially in the high school and college, when you want to double up on events, this is a good chance to see if your jumper can also be your relay guy. And we've seen so many good uh, crossovers. We've seen 110 hurdlers do the 100. We've seen... Uh, 100 meter hurdlers do the 400 meters. We do, and we've seen them all, right? We've seen long jumpers, triple jumpers come out of everywhere. So I personally love these tests, which is why I guess I talk about it a lot on the blog because it just it's a test. It it identifies um, what you can do. Okay, let's talk about strength a bit. Now this is a we can spend all day talking about bench press and power clean correlations, but tell me some of the things you do for the test, other you know, the basic for bench power clean deadlifts. The squats. I'm not a big fan of the snatch, uh, especially for a non, um, you know, uh, Olympic lifter. Yeah, but tell me some of the three or four tests that you do, and, and, and what's and the big question I have is, when you test for max strength, are you doing a one rep max or a double, two reps? And I'll give you my answer after. But go ahead. Well, the answer is C. I don't do either of those. Um, I'll explain what I do in a moment. The two athletes that I have pictured here, one of them I coach directly and one of them I helped indirectly. So the athlete to the left is uh, Lee Ward. He played fullback at Stanford. He was a walk-on um, with no scholarship his first year as a walk-on, but he earned the reputation for being a mauler and a brawler, gotten many fights with, uh, what's the guy's name, uh, the defensive back for the uh, Seahawks, and now he's with uh, San Francisco, Richard Sherman. So he did fights with him at every practice and all this kind of stuff. And that's uh, the first year that he was there is when Harbaugh was there. So, you know, Harbaugh really liked that pound and ground and grind type of guy. So Lee ended up setting a national record um, in the bench press for the Army All-American game um, when they do a combine for the juniors. So he was invited down there as a junior uh, in high school to test out, and he actually did – 47 straight reps of 185 pounds. And they don't do the 225 because there's a lot of high schoolers that just can't even bench 225. By the time he graduated college, he was still second in the nation amongst all positions in his bench press test. He did over 30 plus reps of 225 and only an offensive lineman beat him. Now, why am I sharing that? Well, in contrast, we have a young lady here who's from Buchanan, high school in Fresno, that young lady is actually the 2019 state champion in the 200 meter dash. She was a cheerleader and her coach, coach Weaver went up to her and said, listen, do you want to be the best that you can be? We've never had a chance to really work with you. You've always been doing this competitive cheer. And this is the first year that we won't be splitting time between cheerleading and track. Um, I really would like to take you through the weight program that's in the sprinters compendium and see what we can get done. And you can tell that young lady's got some guns on her. She's built. Um, and she went from running her junior year, uh, a 2482 wind dated down to a 2379 in the state finals in California. That is very non-typical of a progression for a female athlete as a senior. However, Coach Weaver is a hell of a coach. And if you wanna know who a good coach is, see a good coach that keeps making girls better after they hit puberty and you'll find yourself a good coach boy coaches those dudes are getting chest hair and 
deeper voices. It's almost like a testosterone is almost like a cheat code, right? I mean, obviously, that's why some people do that for performance enhancement. Well, what's the point? Well, Lee, through weight training and testing, he got bigger and bigger and bigger. And he was a track guy as well. But she almost could beat him in the 100-meter dash because we got him too big to be fast. And so one of the things that would have been good to inform us is the combination of the tests that we previously talked about and measuring them in co correlation to the improvements that we've done here in the weight room. She obviously did it the right way. Um, she's a much later athlete. I mean, 2019, Lee's been out of college for a couple years now. But these are lessons learned. And the reason why testing is so important, so maybe you don't sacrifice speed just for maximum strength. So for me as a high schooler, I don't test the clean, I don't test the snatch, because most athletes don't know how to clean and snatch in high school. So you're gonna get false positives. Kids who can just move the bar really well and have great technique are gonna be the best in our school versus people who might actually be the strongest. When I do my protocol for the bench and the squat, I start out with 10 reps, then eight, then six, and then we do sets of five. And, one, and we keep loading the bar up by five to 10 pounds heavier and heavier as we move up. And once they reach um, five reps that they can barely finish or they fail in a set of five as they move the weight up, then we use that as a calculator for their maximum weight. And I like the five reps because that's traditionally, you know, if you look at certain data, that's about 85% of a max. So you can reverse that out and figure out what the max is and then train from there. I really don't like doing singles or doubles because people get hurt. Thank God when I was doing my maximum protocol, when I was doing singles, and I put 365 on the bar and I wanted to go to, you know, or 360 on the bar and it came off my chest like a feather. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be smart. I'm just going to put the little nickels on the side, the teeny tiny, you know, two and a half pound weights. And Lee was there to spot me and it felt completely opposite. It felt like I had a dump truck that just sat on my chest and I ended up tearing my pectoral minor. And so through that experience, I never want to put an athlete in danger, potentially ruin their high school career. And so even though it might not be completely accurate to go to five reps and consider that 85%, I feel like it's much safer. It avoids lawsuits for me. And again, because the data is consistent throughout my program for over a decade, it informs me of what those athletes' abilities are. Now, that's not to say that I've got video of Lee Ward doing, you know, 550 uh, 50 plus pounds in high school in a squat, you know, and he's doing three reps. I've got that on film and we've done that, but that's with an athlete who is the most superior strength athlete I've ever coached. So I don't do doubles or singles ever. Um, and I tend to not do the Olympic lifts as a test. We do do the Olympic lifts and I value them a ton but I traditionally do those as our first lift. The Olympic lift will always be the first lift we're in the weight room because it requires so many motor units and it requires so much of the neurological system. Yeah, same here, that's my first test as well. Actually, there's an article in my blog that talks about uh, ratios. So if you can do five reps, uh, what's your theoretical one rep max? I'll post that in the link after, after we're done here. It's awesome. funny, uh, it's funny we talked about uh, weight room workouts. So my typical workouts is eight, six, four, two, two or seven, five, three, three, or two. Uh, so when you're doing that two, three days a week for several months, several years, you're not afraid to do a double, to do two reps. So for me, I never had anybody get injured doing a double test when you do my weight training program. And then back to the bench press, the, uh, when I was in Vancouver, um, this shows you how old I was, uh, Pavel Bure, hockey player for the NHL, Right. Uh, they also do 185 pounds, not 225 pounds for the bench press test. And guess how many Pavel Burry reps he can do at 185? I, I would assume he had to have been like in the upper 30s or 40s or whatever. 40. He did 40. <laughs> he did 40. Uh, which that would be a guy amazing. I would not want to tangle on a slippery surface with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's quite, a, quite an athlete. Uh, anyway, so that's some little trivia there. Okay, let's yeah. move on here. Um, injury prevention, speaking about pec tears. Um, yeah. Yeah, what is, yeah, yeah, let's talk about some of the things uh, that, that you do to identify, uh, to prevent injury. I, I got my, my series of, of tests, but I'm curious to see what, what you do 
to uh, prevent injuries? Well, so my pro injury prevention protocol is, is uh, a thorough warm up, you know, kind of taking that idea of Carl Valley, slow cook the meat is one of the phrases I heard him use. I don't know if that's his or not, but I'll give him credit for it um, because it's the first place I've heard it. And, you know, there's this kind of obsession or excitement around this idea of like the old SNL skit, five minute abs. Oh no, well, what if somebody comes up with three minute abs? or two minute abs. So for me, we spend a lot of time, 45 minutes um, at the beginning of our practice, warming up generally, doing static and dynamic stretching. Now, not on the same day, we typically rotate those. We then spend a ton of time on drills. And early on, my drills tend to have an extensive list. And then as we move forward, I kind of reduce that list down, but add other things that challenge them by maybe combining the different, you know, drills. So doing a high knee into a butt kick or a quick ankle into an A run or an A skip, B skip complex or a high knee run into a straight leg bound or vice versa. And we'll do that. Now, how does that help? I'm testing them every day. I use those drills as a test, as a protocol and to make sure that those kids aren't nursing an injury. They don't look tight. They don't show grimace. They don't show um, favoritism to one side of the body or another. And so we do that every day. And part of it is to improve some, you know, small muscle groups that are part of stabilization of the core and the lumbar area and the hip flexor and things like that that make athletes better. I also believe that those drills do overcharge the neurological system forcing a better mechanical byproduct from that. Some people don't believe that's true. I think it's because they're not patient enough. It takes about 500 hours to change a skill. You know, think about Stephen Curry in basketball, right? He had to go through this huge process to change his shot. And now he's hitting, you know, shots from when he steps off the bus, where previously, even though he was very accurate with his old form, um, it wasn't going to be effective in the NBA. If you need any evidence of that, look at, the Lonzo ball and how ineffective he is as a shooter and probably should have spent a lot of time instead of, you know, social media with his daddy working on his jump shot. Right. So it's the same idea in my philosophy with drills. So that Lizzie Dejwa that I mentioned about 40 minutes ago, she mechanically looked more and more like a sprinter by the time she was a senior in high school from this, instead of this little water bug shuffler that she was when she first got to us. But that took a lot of time and development to build that in. Now, in the meantime, you know, in between seasons, if you don't know an athlete, and you have no experience with them. Our trainer will actually take all of our girls and he sets up appointment times in the summer. I mean, he's awesome. And he'll take them through this functional movement screening. And then he'll send us with drills and activities to do that are prescriptive to improving some of the weaknesses or imbalances that those athletes are showing. And um, I think it's good for the kids to have a couple voices um, in their ear, and I trust him a lot. And so I let him kind of take what we've got here up on the screen, a, you know, breakdown or bastardization of this program and kind of run them through it to score them out. And then he comes back with a chart and data and suggestions, which I think is really important before you start to train your athlete. You need to know what you're getting into. It's like if you go to, a, you know, a car collector and the car looks really shiny. It's got great brand new paint on it and brand new interior, but the chassis isn't put together right. You're going to need to know that, and you're going to need to take a look around the car more than just kicking the tires. Yeah, no, this is good. Uh, so for me personally, I never do any of these tests because being Canadian, I grew up <laughs> under the Gerard Mock system. Right. And I'm a big believer in ABCs, high knees, mm -hmm. butt kicks, and, and leg extensions. And I always watch my athletes do the drills because I can tell you if something's wrong. Like, like if someone has a knee problem, they're not going to make any noise doing butt kicks. <laughs> you should right. hear that snap if, if you have healthy knees and something's wrong. Or if you have tight quads, you're not going to do that either. So that's one of my tests that I like to just watch on that one. The other thing is that I guess back in my days, uh, uh, PNF stretching was popular. I don't think I don't see it popular anymore for some reason. But when you're helping your teammate uh, stretch his hamstring or her hamstring, uh, you can tell if they're tight, right? Because we had 
the same people stretching each other and I can see the range of motion that my teammate would do. And I know, um, you know, I can detect it. So those are some of the, my tests that I do for injury prevention. Uh, and this is good. Um, yeah, and, and, sp yeah. and speaking of the PNF tests or uh, PNF stretching, that's actually the third phase that I do in our stretching program throughout a season. And the reason why I choose it to be last is it kind of requires them to know like, all right, here are the basic stretches. Now here are your partner stretches. You have a partner that you trust that's your big or little sister in my program. Now that you trust them and they know the seriousness as we move to the end of the season, then we do the PNF at the final or championship phase. So in my program, we actually phase out our static stretching to do that. And again, just like you said with uh, right. Gerard Mock, those drills are so very important. And then kind of the, uh, the neo Gerard Mock is, you know, Franz Bosch and all of his creative drills and things like that as well. And one of the biggest things that I hate, and I actually, I don't usually get after my assistant coaches, but the one thing I do get after them about is if they're standing around chatting when we're doing our running drills, instead of watching the athletes and trying to correct what they're doing because it's not a it's not a time to socialize you need to model to the kids that this is important and it is important just like you said because you catch injuries yeah the only difference from coaching and running for the last 40 years is back then we would be chatting a lot to each other right today they're all on their phone it's the only difference right. and that kids have more tattoos than ever today than <laughs> 40 years ago there's only two big big things that i notice otherwise track is track so exactly. let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about speed endurance or time. So my, my secret for timing any event, whether it's short flies or speed endurance, is I never choose a distance that's the same as their event. So mm -hmm. if you're a one, two, four person, I'll do 30 meters, 60 meters, 150, and 300. Uh, those are my favorite four distances that I like to, to time all the time. Um, unfortunately, in Canada, 300 meters is the indoor event. Uh, for Canadian universities, but the 300 um, is a wonderful uh, test. How about for yourself, Ryan? What distances do you like to test for? Well, well, in terms of intervals and practice, I love to do off distance intervals, just like you like to do. I think they're great. Um, and the reason why I like to do them is because, again, if you go back to Andre Tolley Bondarchuk's transfer of training, and you look at his charts in terms of distance runs and or I, when I say distance, I mean sprint runs, interval runs. Um, the highest correlation is just above and just below the race distance. Right. And another reason why I don't like to run race distances in practice is because kids will race instead of doing the thing that they're supposed to do, which is training. And more importantly, I don't want them, if they have a bad interval in practice, sometimes that gets in their head and they don't think they're as fast or the time they ran was a fluke. And you and I both know that that's the reason why we put our jerseys on and we compete because we get something extra out of that. You know, there's an extra oomph that comes from that performance when we're in a uniform and we're competing for real and reacting to a starter's pistol. So, yeah, in practice, I traditionally don't like to run the actual distances. However, when I'm doing time trials, um, we, we'll talk about that on the next slide, but I like to do the actual distance, but I like to get a couple of weeks, three weeks of training underneath our belt so that we just get all the dust and the weirdness and the, stiff, the stiffness and the adjustment, you know, and a little bit of super compensation um, before we go to the actual distance. Um, another thing I'll do, which I got from Mike Hurst, most importantly, is I'll do like overtime. So what we'll do is we'll have them run, um, you know, if their PR in the 200 is 25 seconds, we'll have them see how far they can get in 29 seconds. So typically they'll get farther than 200 meters in that time, obviously. And then we'll put a cone out as their personal record to see where they're at. Tony Holler has a similar thing. He calls it the 23 second drill. And it's like one of the few like lactic hydrogen ion type workouts that he does for um, his sprinters in the weeks that they don't have two meets or maybe a competition at all. Um, I like that as well. I think that's valuable. Um, in all of those types of situations, I feel like you need to spike your kids up though because you're expecting them to give you a really, really hard effort over a farther distance traditionally. 
Another thing we'll do, um, if I don't know where the athletes are at in their speed endurance, we'll do a 45 second test. And that kind of gives us and informs us on their, you know, uh, special endurance skill set um, or really long speed endurance skill set. And typically, once you get to 40 seconds at a maximum effort, you're no longer, you know, buffering that waste product. You start to get the booty lock, you start to get the legs faded, the bear jumps on. And so I'm always interested in trying to figure out okay, what does that look like? How far can they get? And where maybe do they have a talent? You know, if they're an outlier on that comparatively to some of their other tests, again, that might inform me that they're going to be a great 400 meter runner or sprinter, or they might end up being a middle distance, long distance or long sprinter type of athlete. So with our tests, when we run these type of time trials, I'll do it three weeks to four weeks into the season so that we actually have a little bit of training, a little bit of understanding. We've taught the blocks, you know, these type of things, because we're going to be getting close to the complete or maybe even longer than the distance they're going to run as their main event. Now, for me, with outcomes, um, what we usually see is if I time trial them three to four weeks into the season, every female sprinter in my program will run about seven tenths faster in the hundred. They'll run average uh, a second and a half faster in the 200. They'll run four seconds faster from their time trial 400 unless they're a freshman, and they'll run seven seconds faster from their time trial, which again, when you have a database of those tests for over 10 years, you can start to figure out by grade level, by the team, and by the overall history of your program where those kids are going to go, and you can make some predictions on how weak or strong they're going to be in a particular event. The other thing I try to do is I try to theme up those tests with whatever we're doing. So if we're doing a special endurance day, that will be the day I do my 400. If we're doing a um, speed endurance day, that'll be the day I do the 200. If we're doing an elactic day or an all-out sprint day, that's the day I'll do the 100. So that way it fits within the theme of my week or whatever my sessions might be. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, actually. I like that. And I guess I do that subconsciously. But I know if you're a 2-4 runner, and especially training long to short, 204 meters, running a 150 will not trash your legs. Correct. Fact, we even do a 150 time trial on a Wednesday before a Saturday meet. And, it's, and if you're properly trained with the volumes that we do, the speeds that we do, it's not going to bother you. So um, Yeah, not at all. I mean, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, yeah. it takes like, what, 48 hours for the neurological system to yeah. kind of reset. So you're giving them 72 hours. They're going to be fine. I think that there's a fear to go longer and that's dangerous because it's undercutting the majority of the events on the track. You know, you got to go a little bit longer to get something out of it. If everybody just does the small training, the short intervals, then they're only going to be good at that. And it's going to come down to who has the genetic freak. Then your role as a coach doesn't really matter that much. And I feel like we need to matter and they should be good at because of us, not in spite of us, you know? No, exactly. Um, this this slide actually intrigued me a bit. Can you tell me a bit more about brain and learning types? Uh, this slide. Yeah. Here. So if you're if you're left if you're left-handed, you're in your right mind, right? And you tend to be artistic. You tend to be creative, right? You tend to be um, more emotional. Um, if you're uh, right-handed, you tend to be more analytical, scientific, and a thinker. And lo and behold, most of your thinker athletes tend to be right-handed and most of your warrior type athletes tend to be left-handed so it's not unusual to see that a lot of your sprinters might actually be more creative than they are you know analytical you know and that might frustrate a lot of high school coaches who tend to be distance runners and tend to be analytical and thinkers and grinders and so there's always a disconnect there and so when you learn that you have a better way of explaining things to athletes to get them to buy in. So if I've got a right-brained or right-handed athlete, I'm going to talk to him about, here's what the science says. This is what the math is. This is what the physics says it about. You know, if it's a left-handed athlete, I'm going to talk about how it should feel and the emotions behind it and the drama of the movement, you know, and I'm going to explain it that way. Another thing that you can figure out from that and figure out what they are is you'll do a simple test where you have them cross over their hands with their thumb, you know, 
doing like, you know, their hands together, like in a prayer with the fingers crossed each other. And whatever thumb sits up top, that tends to be their dominant hand. If they cross their arms and whatever arm sits up top, that's their dominant hand. And right now in the camera, it's mirrored. So it's reversed. I'm left-handed. This is my left hand. Okay. But you do that. If you push them from behind and whatever leg steps forward, that's their, their leg. That's more of their athletic leg or what a coach said recently, it might've been Keba Tolbert, but it's their smart leg. And the leg that stays back is their dumb leg. Well, sure enough, when they're in the blocks, the dumb leg is the one that's going to go up front and the smart leg is the one that's going to go in back because that's the leg that's going to step up. And so it informs you on what they are. So then what I do is I will have the athletes take pictures and draw pictures of things that are important to them. A, I want to know what they value, but B, I want to see how good of an artist they are. If they're a really good artist, that informs me that they're probably more creative. If they're a terrible artist and they write a lot and their penmanship is decent, then that probably means that they're more analytical and more scientific. And then I have them fill out, you know, what are some words that describe you to give me a sense of where their brain is at and what they feel about themselves. Now, why do I test them like that? A, I want to learn something about them. B, I want to see how honest they are. But C, it then gives me leverage later to say, now, wait a second. You said that you were passionate. And today you're not bringing it. You don't seem to be into this. Where's the passion that you said was so important? You know, you said that you were aggressive and you're letting this person push you around all around the track and you never exert your authority and go to the front. If you're an aggressive person, then you need to live that and become it and get yourself to the front. Don't sit behind and let everybody do the work for you. You take control of the race. And so this is a way to inform you on left to right brain, thinker versus warrior, what's important to them. Do they see it or feel it? Again, seeing it, hamstring centric, in flight, air mechanics, you know, feeling it on the ground, pushing tends to be quad centric, right? And so all of these tests go together to build this collage of data that creates a really beautiful, clear picture on the ability and the mental capacity and the thoughts that are running through this athlete. I never thought about that, actually. For me, I think about the relay, the four by one relay. Uh, my, my second leg has to be a good left-handed person or right. able to receive and give a left hand, uh, which is why we saw Usain Bolt run the third leg on the curve early in his career, because he's right-handed. And right. that's why you see him, him and Carl Lewis switch their batons when they get the baton on and running anchor. Interesting, right. very interesting. I think, uh, when we, I think what we'll do is that we'll have another, another call with uh, open to the public. And I think sure. a lot of this stuff is gonna be interesting for these people. Let them watch this video first and then we'll have a more deeper in call. Um, so I think we sort of covered here all the tests that you do. Anything yeah. you wanna, anything here that we didn't cover, I believe we covered it all. Um, yeah, this yeah, is this, just, if yeah. you're a youth or developmental coach, there are a couple extra things in here just to try to cast a wide net. Yeah. So like if we're doing the overhead softball t or shot put backwards, that's kind of our medicine ball test, you know, but we do a shot because it's always going to be the same in the shot put ring done the same way every time. So the data is consistent. We throw a softball because I want to see how good a kid can javelin. We do gymnastics and hurdle skills because we want to see how bodily aware a kid is, even if they're not fast, you know, per se, do they have kinesthetic awareness? They could maybe be a great high jumper or a triple jumper that doesn't per se require the same amount of speed. Um, so these are things of trying to give kids um, a roadmap to success early so that they love the sport and that we have success and we can win some track meets. But more importantly, they feel like they're doing something they're getting better at, you know? And then, like I said, some of the tests I do a little bit later because it takes a while to get some things out of the athletes. You know, if I had a sprinter, I would never do a mile test if I knew they were a sprinter. But if they're a track kid coming to my team for the first time, I have no idea what they're good at. So I've got to make sure I've definitely got them in the right event and I'm not taking them out of a chance to be special at something else. And that goes in reverse too. Sometimes kids 
who might be a good cross country kid in the fall for you might not actually, even though they're a good distance runner in cross country, they might be really great at something else. Like we had a young lady on our basketball team this year that was the highest point scorer on our team. And she's a great overall athlete. She's got more state championship experience over three sports than any girl in school history. Um, and she was a big part of that. And unfortunately we lost our track season this year. Cause I basically told her you're not running distance in the spring. You're too good as a basketball player to just go out there and run slow and turn left. We're going to triple jump. We're going to long jump. We're going to high jump because she's huge. I mean, she was almost six foot tall, you know, and here I am thinking as a coach, gosh, darn it. I've just wasted three years of this kid's time because I failed to test him. Now, why did I fail to test her? Because basketball season goes beyond our first two or three weeks of our season because they're always in the playoffs. So I never get to test her in that. And, you know, it was until my senior year that I get her senior year. I go, oh, now I know why I've stuck her over here and I'm watching her development in basketball. I've screwed this whole thing up. <laughs> she could be really good at these things, but I just made an assumption because she was a cross country kid. So, yeah. you know. There's actually a good test for endurance and, and the soccer players use it. It's the beat test. Yeah. You heard that? Yeah. That, yes. And, and the irony is that the one of the few people, few soccer players can actually complete the test at the end. And uh, David Beckham is one right. that actually can do the full test. So that shows you the uh, endurance that he has. Absolutely. And why he was an elite player besides just his set piece kicks, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I think that's it for the slides, Ryan. Thank you very much for your time today. It was really uh, interesting. I, I learned a few things. And I think we definitely should have another call with people. Um, maybe we can do a, sh a quick, shorter talk and then open up the uh, questions to the people because I think there were some people on your Facebook that wanted to have this call as a live chat so I think we have enough base here to get started and I'm really curious to hear other people's uh, methodologies on testing. It would be an amazing conversation I appreciate you taking time with me today and letting me share and I would definitely be game for coming back I always like to do this especially in the time that we're in right now it's so important to level up so to speak in terms of your knowledge and get challenged by passionate coaches. So I'm welcoming to the challenges and interesting questions as well. Likewise. Okay, Ryan, thank you very much. And uh, maybe we'll see you next week. Thanks, Jimson. Okay, bye.